Good evening, Ambassador, invited speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second and last part of this seminar, Art Museums in Mutation, Architecture Meets Museography. This event has been organized by the Embassy of Spain in Sweden in collaboration with Stockholm Association of Architects. And it's sent live on the YouTube channels of both these bodies. I'm Elizabeth Hatz, an architect, art curator, and professor with practice in Sweden and teaching in Ireland. And I will lead you through this evening. As we could hear last night, the theme is broad and complex. Museum architecture also exposes in its own term a potential tension between the focus on the architecture and the presence of the content, between the attraction of the place as a spatial event and the conditions connected directly with the exhibited authentic object. On happy occasions, the two are negotiating into a coherence of rare beauty. Let me now present tonight's speakers in the order of appearance. Emilio Dunyon, and you will uh, forgive my Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Is chair professor of the Madrid School of Architecture at SAM and founder of Mansilia Tunion Architects. They have received many awards, amongst which we count Spanish Architecture Prize, European Union Prize for Contemporary Architecture, Miss van der Rohe Award, and the RIBA International Fellowship. After Emilio, we will have Michaela Giebelhausen, she will join us uh, on uh, a link, um, if, so it will, she's not here uh, in person. She has uh, an MA uh, from Frankfurt, and she's um, Doctor of Philosophy Oxon, an associate lecturer at the Courtauld Institute of Art in London. Her fo work focuses the 19th century British art, <coughs> museum architecture, and exhibition histories. After Michaela, we have Juan Paolo Pablo Rodriguez Frede. Established, uh, he established the Frede Architectos in 2005, and the major work include the National Archaeological Museum of Spain, the History of Madrid Museum, and the Alhambra Museum for which he was awarded the National Prize of Renovation in 95. But their portfolio also contains a huge number of exhibitions in Europe, Asia, Latin America, and Australia. Fuesanta Nieto has, um, is co-founder of um, Nieto Sobellano Arquitectos, uh, and she graduated from the Universidad uh, Politecnica de Madrid and also from uh, Columbia University in New York. Uh, she was professor at the University Europea de, Ma uh, de Madrid uh, and also co-director of the architectural journal, Arquitectura. Um, she chairs and participates in international conferences and juries and uh, she also received the Aga Khan Award for Architecture in 2010, the Albert Alto Medal 2015, and the Gold Medal of Merit in the Fine Arts in 2017. After which we have two speakers in conjunction, uh, Victor Cajiao, Perfect. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> Director of Buildings and Environment at, and Architect of, at the Museo del Prado, and Letizia Azque, uh, Head of the Sculpture and Decorative Arts at the Museo del Prado. And they are also joining us 
virtually. Last but not least, we have Manuel Fontan, Director of Museums and Exhibitions, Fondation Juan Marc, also joining us virtually. So, I will give the floor to our first speaker, um, Emilio Tunion, and we will give him an applause to welcome him, and we will ask the <laughs> other either to run. Um, Uno, sí. Emilia, we talk about the contemporary museum as an urban icon. Uh, as we have many speakers, I'm going to be a little bit firm with timekeeping. So, uh, a couple of minutes before the end, I will just raise a little hand and salute thank you. Thank you, thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you to the ambassador. It's a pleasure for me to be here and this opportunity for all of us to, to try to explain some de of the project that we are we have been working in, in, in Spain. I'm going to, to explain this. I have to confess that uh, this, this lecture was prepared in for 40 minutes, and then I have to speed up a little. And uh, I'm going to go f uh, through some uh, slides in a, a little in a hurry. OK, this is the building that I'm going to talk about, that is the Mossack. And it's a project that, that was designed by Mancilla Etuño. Mancilla passed away uh, 10 years ago. And he spent here a year, uh, he spent in Stockholm a year after his studies, after being in Roma. And she's, she was completely a big fan of, of this incredible city. Uh, the project that I'm going to talk about is the MUSAC, that is an art contemporary center in um, Castilla y León, in León. The León is a, is a city that uh, was with this river, that is the uh, Bernesga River and Torrio River. And uh, the origin of this city is this small square that is a Roman uh, settlement, the Legio Septima settlement, that was placed in here. You can appreciate the uh, Roman uh, walls with the, the Cumanos and the Cardo. And this is the extension of the, of the Middle Ages and all these uh, are uh, farmlands. Uh, the city, as, as all of the cities in the world, has been growing a lot, and now it, it occupies all, all this uh, surface. You can appreciate here the, the traces of the Roman uh, walls and, and, and the cathedral that is in the, in the Cardus here. That is the other building, the two most important buildings in, in León. In the outer skirts of the city, uh, there is a, a I, mean, I didn't talk about this. There is, there is to be here. Well, there is a, a small, uh, an incredible uh, pilgrimage hospital. That is this one, San Marcos Pilgrimage Ho Hospital. Uh, that is uh, here. And then uh, we we won a competition for an auditorium that is placed. Let me see if I am able to. to uh, this is San Marcos, and the auditorium is this. Is this? and then the mosaic is placed here. In the outer skirt of the city, the city was growing, first of all, in this part, then uh, this is the extension of the 60s, this is the extension of the 80s, and this is the extension of the 90s, uh, and it's a little uh, out of, of the city. Now, this is the place. Uh, here is a, it's a, the, the, the pilgrimage hospital and other buildings, the extension of the 60s, and this uh, strange space with the auditorium here and that was designed for us also, and the music that is placed here. The question was that they were, they were trying, the, the government of Castilla León wanted to build a cultural center in this area with the auditorium, the auditorium that is here, and the uh, art contemporary uh, center that is with this one, in order to try to establish a kind of new center of the city in this part of the city, no? close to the, to the, to the um, uh, hospital. I'm going to explain the project in, uh, by means of six different uh, landscape or approaches. Uh, the first one is about uh, the personal approach. The personal approach, uh, we were at that moment, this is an old project, this was from 2003, and the fin project was finished, the building was finished in 2005. But we were uh, concerned about, at that moment, with equality and diversity. This idea that everybody is equal to the other, and at the same time, is different to the others. That is to say that we wanted to work with this idea, very simple, in architecture. 
And we deal with this in the, in the Museum of Zamora. This was a museum in which the highlights, all of them are equal, but the galleries are completely different in different orientation, constructing this building that is trying to establish a, new, a kind of new icon in this small city of, of Zamora. And the Auditorium of León that is in, in, in Zamora was in plan, this idea of equality and diversity in León is in, in the facade with these uh, flair uh, windows that I, oh, everyone is different to the other, each one is different to the other, you can appreciate, and you can appreciate here the, the, the construction of the building with this auditorium. And the third one was the Museum of Fine Arts in Castellón that we use the equality and diversity in section. No? We, we had to pile up for uh, museums, one for uh, uh, the one for fine arts, uh, archaeology, uh, ethnology, and, and tiles and, and ceramic uh, museum, and then we pile them up in, in this kind of uh, establishing these double height spaces in a, a cascade of double height spaces, trying to have this exactly the same surface of in every single museum, but in every one was uh, a little different. Here is the, the, the cascade of the spaces, as you appreciate. And the building that we are going to talk about is this one, the MUSAG, in which we deal with the same idea. This is the plan in which we wanted to establish a set of different galleries, as you can appreciate. All of them are equal. Well, this is the, uh, the square of the entrance, trying to explain a little the, the program, the, the entrance with the lobby. The, this is the book, uh, the bookshop, the library, and the temporary exhibition, uh, store rooms, and the galleries. All the galleries are equal, are independent, with a, uh, a mechanical system that may, uh, allow it to be uh, independent, and all of them are equal and, and different to the other with this uh, system. Well, here is the lobby with these two skylights, the, the, the different galleries, you can appreciate this is in a, uh, at the end of the construction with these skylights and these uh, patios that appear in, in some places. This is diagonalization of the space, of the transversal point of view of the, of the different galleries. And this one that is in the, uh, with the connecting with the facade. The second approach is this one that is the, the intellectual one. I, I, uh, I, I love this, this sentence by Paul Barry that says the poem is a prolonged hesitation between sound and, 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 and sen. No? We think that architecture has something like the, that. No? At, the, at the end, it's a prolonged hesitation between form and sense. And this is the first sketch that we made uh, in which we, try, we were trying to establish a system for these galleries that they were going to be equal and different to the others. And there is this kind of uh, permanent oscillation or permanent uh, hesitation. No? Here are the different models that we made with different options. Once we establish this idea of, of these uh, galleries that are equal and different to the others and are made up with squares and rhombuses, we have different opportunities different uh, systems, so this one, this is a wire model, that, and this is a, another thing that is a, a, a study, an analysis for the dimension of the different uh, glasses. In, because we establish this system, but at the end, every single wall in the abstract model is exactly the same dimension, but according to the depth of the uh, different walls, the dimension is not the same, then you have to decide if you use 9, 10, or 11, glasses in every single space. That is to say that all the glasses in, the, in every single facade are different, but at the same time you have the feeling that all of them are completely the same. The third uh, approach, this one that is about geometry and material materiality, which, uh, well, this is a model, wire model of the, of the system that we were trying to, to, to build at that moment, that is with uh, uh, 500 uh, beans, prefabricated beans, uh, walls made up with uh, co white concrete, some skylight, and, and so on. Uh, the geometry, is, uh, uh, this is the, constru the construction uh, in which you can appreciate the different, the different walls. That is very simple construction with walls of white concrete, with beams, with uh, the mechanical system in at, the, at the roof. As you can appreciate here, some squares, some, so the square, the patios, and the skylights in some points. 
is the, the, the construction of the building that was, for me, was the... We usually say that the time is a material of construction because every single project that we have been involved, it takes us at least 10 years. And this building was designed and constructed in two years, 12, 22, 24 months. And it was because it was very simple system with these prefabricated uh, beams and so on. The fourth one is the historical one. The historical one uh, applies to this system of the, the, you can appreciate here, the, the walls of the city and the most important building of the, of the city, that is this one, the, 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 the uh, cathedral. The Gothic Cathedral is a very, it's a very well known, it's called the Pulcra Leonina Cathedral, no? because it's a very perfect, it's, 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 it was designed in the 13th century, but it was uh, transformed up to the 19th century. But the, this is the walls of the, of the uh, Leo Septima city, and then the cathedral, and we try to use these two uh, references for our building. No? In the first case, this is a, a Roman mosaic made up with squares and rhombuses, establishing a set of relations in between all of them in order to have, when you have a, a square, you have that you, there is a, a rhombus here, another one, another one, and so on. And the system of the, the geometry of the mosaic is exactly the same. We have a square, a rhombus, a rhombus. That is to say that we know, with this system, we know very well what is happening around one piece, one of, of one of these pieces, but we really don't know what is the final form of the project. It's not uh, here, it's the system with the squares and the rhombuses and the, the limit that we decided to, to use, the, the, uh, the, the plant that we have, we have already seen, and uh, the second thing is the, the, the treatment of the glasses, stained glass uh, windows of the facade. No? We took the uh, Pulcra Leonina, this incredible uh, Gothic cathedral that was uh, from the night, from the 13th to the 19th constructed. That is why it's so perfect. And the interior there is this, uh, this uh, stained glass uh, windows. And then we took the oldest one, that is the Hunter one. And the, this is a piece of this one, that is the Falconer and we took a piece and then digitalized and, and established the set of the facade and this is the system of the glasses of the facade that is constructing this space that is it tries to construct uh, the new public space of the city in the 21st century like uh, at the same uh, way that the cathedral used to be the, uh, the the public space of the city in the in the middle ages here is the facade this system and the system without the colors in the rest of the construction and so on. Different system, this is the skylights of the of the lobby. And uh, okay, the fifth is about uh, nature. Nature that is uh, this is the landscape of of, of Castilla Leon, it's a very anthropized uh, landscape in which you can appreciate some part that it looks as if it were natural, but at the end you realize that there is this geometry, this uh, artificial geometry that is over overlapping all the surface of the of this landscape, this uh, anthropos anthropicized uh, landscape. In this moment, we thought we were talking about Stan Allen, that is a friend of us that we were working, we were working with Rafael Moneo for ten years with him. And then we, we were talking about this kind of geometries in which if you establish a set of rules, a set of rules in, in, in one piece, this piece establishes some kind of relationship with the pieces that are surrounding it in order to establish a kind of local behavior pattern. You know, in, you know, it's like, like a flock of, of birds or like a school of, of fish or like this uh, piece of, uh, uh, this piece designed by Barry Levin that is with this, this kind of a set of laws that establish some kind of system in order to have the system. Now, it's uh, something similar to the to the mosque in which you have uh, the Spanish mosque, the Cordoba mosque, in which you have the, the column, this column, you know what is happening in this system, in this bay, this bay, the distance in this one, and you know what is happening here, but not what is happening in all the building, that is, then the building started here, and, and grow this part, and grow this part, and grow this part, up here the, the old the Gothic uh, nave, and then appear the, the Renaissance uh, 
uh, cathedral here. No? It was transformed, but at the end, with a simple set of rules, all the mosque was built. No? In, in other modern buildings, like, like this by Aldo Van Eyck in the orphanage that everybody knows very well, or this one by Le Corbusier, happens the same system. That is to say that we wanted to establish this kind of field in which a set of rules, in this case geometrical and constructive, allows us to establish a, a, a relationship between all the pieces that are surrounding one in order to have a kind of local behavior pattern that in which the, 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 the final form it depends of the geometry of the city or depends of the necessities of the client. Okay, this is the uh, uh, volume and the asonometric of the building and the building that, that the song of the picture that I made when we finished the building here. In, in, uh, it's one of the trying to, to, to show this idea of the fill in what we worked uh, at that moment with the project. But uh, maybe the, I have been talking about the process of architecture. But maybe the, the, last, the last one, that is one that is about artistic and, and, and social, from my point of view, is the most important. I, I have been talking about the process of, of how we were thinking how to deal with this building. But at the end, the important thing is the life of the building. And that this life of the building depends on this idea of, of encounter. Trying to establish a kind of uh, endless uh, public conversation with the city, with the with the people, with everybody. No, bueno, this is the opening with this uh, with these uh, nice bags and people in the building, and uh, we're going to try to to go uh, to the history of the building as it has been uh, used by the people of León and the citizens and the. Uh, uh, visitants. No? The first movement uh, that uh, these people made was to design, to convoke a, a, a competition for the logo, for the logo of the Musak. And the one that won, that is a, 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 a team that uh, said that there is no need for a logo, no, a no logo. This is 2002, and now McLean has published this no logo in 2000. There is some kind of relationship. But it's interesting, no, this idea that you can have the, 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 the logo in a, in a uh, reaching a, a head or knitting on a, on a pillow or uh, with ketchup or high speaking or, or on a cake, whatever. No? The second one was this idea that we finished as soon the, the building. It was incredible for me too. No, in, in, 12, in, 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 in 24 months, we made the design, the license, and the uh, construction. But they didn't have a single piece of art to put inside. Yeah, no? And then it was an, an envelope, uh, an empty envelope. An empty, and, and someone talked yesterday I talk, uh, said about, about the uh, empty vessels. No? This idea of to have a building in the middle of a small city that is a, like an incredible building the, in, in the side. And they decided that the first exhibition was do it by yourself. No? Every, it's a do it yourself exhibition. No? Everybody were there to make their own drawings. And then it was very funny because on, in some part there are some these people, or feminists, or another part there are kids, another part are uh, people against the violence, another, I don't know, immigrants, and so on. No? It was an incredible exhibition. And the, the funniest thing is that all the kids in the city set a drawing in this exhibition, and they were collecting for the director. And then they have the first collection of the, of the Musac is the drawings that these people have made, and mainly, I have to confess, and mainly boys and, and girls and the kids that they were drawing about that. It was an incredible movement because we had a problem that we had a big building completely empty, and they decided to transform this problem into an opportunity. The opportunity to engage the people in the city to the, to the new building. But the first exhibition was this one that this was called Emergency. The emergency is the, this piece by uh, Alfredo Yard, that's in a, an architect from Chile, and an artist. And he made this tank with oil and with uh, the shape of Africa. And then they, they, they are going up and down. No? And they, they call the name of this building, the, uh, this piece of art, 
This work was emergency. And the first exhibition was about emergency. I have to talk about Rafael Doctor. Rafael Doctor is the boss of this, all this process. Because uh, we started building a build, uh, we started constructing a building, uh, designing a building with this set of rules, with uh, this uh, local behavior pattern, with this, with the, with the, uh, the, 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 the remains of the Roman uh, uh, mosaics and so on, because we didn't have a collection. We didn't have a director. We were asking during the whole process to have a director of the, of the institution. And it was named Aldi at the end. And I think he's, he was very important in this process because he was the person that said what the Musac was going to be in the next 12 or 15 um, years. No? He was talking about the social, all the social emergencies, the poverty, the climate change, the immigration, the population, the civil rights, the racial discrimination, the gender inequality, the animal rights, and so on. We are it's very important to think that we are in 2005 in Spain, that many of these concepts, no, nobody was interested on them at all. And it was interesting because Rafael was the one of the first that started to talk about this in order to try to introduce the people of the city into the music in this building. And then you know, I'm going to show some of the, of the images of the different exhibitions. There are thousands of them because they have been, it's very funny because they usually open five exhibitions at the same time. Since we have different galleries, sometimes they use three of them for a big exhibition, like this one of Marina Abramovic, very important exhibition, but there is a, a young artist from León and a designer from uh, Catalonia and a new uh, young collective that are working in, in different things. I'm going to show just one part. No, this one by Marina Abramovic that was talking about body and the earth. Or oh, this one uh, by Pipiloti Riz that was about flesh and, 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 and relax. No, or oh, this one by uh, Sana that it was uh, with this incredible model, the architecture inside the architecture. No, it's how to show architecture in a um, uh, uh, our contemporary center. No? It was very funny, this model designed by Sana, that this was uh, the scale one to two, and it's occupying all, imagine here, a model that is occupying the, the whole space, and you have to go between among the, <laughs> in between the, 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 the model and the wall. No? And this, it was incredible. Or oh, this was by, by Henry and Draxet, that you know very well. That it was a, a self-reference exhibition about the, their life and their problems and, and so on. This one by, by talking about by Marquion Park, about the, the, the landscape in different countries. So this one that I love by Hugo Rondinoni, with this approach to nature and uh, in a very artificial way with these trees. Uh, oil trees that are made in, in cast aluminium, recycled cast aluminium. These uh, are amazing. And now we have one of them in the, in the Helga Albert Foundation, that is the last project museum that I have already opened. Or this one about the, 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 the Silk Road, or Claire Fontaine ab talking about the, the, the fire and pa passion, no? or the real thing is wonderful, that the everyday, talking about the everyday, or this one by Lara Amarcegui, that is a local artist. Uh, that he wanted, she wanted to, to destroy, I have to confess, she wanted to destroy one part of the Musac and produce the, the, the remains. Say, come on, we, we have spent some time, some money, we are not going to, at the end, she built, she set this amount of material that was, he calculated how many, uh, grave and sand and, and concrete and so on and glass and it's the same amount that, it, that every single gallery has. No? It's, it's a funny joke about destroying my building. <laughs> this is primary sectors, feminism, uh, this is in the lobby, just in the lobby, and a, big, a small exhibition about feminism in the lobby, or this one by Bene Belgrado about the, the gravity, or, or Susana Velasco about uh, gra uh, the gravity about construction, popular construction. I love this one by Paul Bostel about life, art, and, and life, how the life and, and, and art are in, interwoven, and uh, how uh, everything can be uh, considered art. I love also this one, The Dreams of Reason, that is a quotation to Goya, the dreams of 
reason produces monsters. That's the old sentence of the, of the uh, drawing by, by Goya, that the, or this one, that the new narratives. But the important thing was the people, how people wa was... Well, I'm going to finish. Well, how people are going to in the in the in the in the building? How the, the, the people are dealing with the building? How the kids are participating in this uh, little friend of Musak or this TV Gypsy TV channel that they will produce or this uh, uh, workshop for kids or this production uh, documentation center? They were producing books and books and books. No, uh, I like this imagine you know, we can edit. Oh, I love this one by Jonah Friedman, architecture with people, by the people, for the people. And this is the motto of our office after this exhibition of Jonah Friedman. Oh, this one in the Musak, this is the lobby also, how the people is dealing with the Musak, no? dealing with the space, no? how the space is full of people. This is the most important thing. With a, What is the best building? The best building is the, people, the building that is used by people, not the most beautiful building. Then the, I like this other, this one that is how the building were uh, invading all the space in 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 in, in Leon. Leon is a small city in, in this northwest of, of Spain with 100,000 people, and at the end they made they produced this space that they were dealing with art, architecture, and and people in a very uh, accurate way and a very uh, carefree uh, way. Thank you very much. I, I think I get it. Thank you so much. That was absolutely beautiful and spot on at uh, time. And I want to apologize because I actually read the uh, speakers in the wrong order. So we actually have, we have, of course, uh, for Santa Nieto now and not after. Um, oh, sorry, God, I'm, I'm messing this up. Totally, sorry. Okay, we have actually Micaela. Uh, and she is coming online. Sorry about that. <laughs> Once it's in the wrong order, it messes up everything. What the visitor experience should be as they cross the threshold. In my short presentation, I want to focus on the historic museum entrance, the ritual of arrival, orientation and welcome, and what it might mean to reconfigure this for the 21st century. Historically, museums have clearly signaled their affiliation with classical culture. Up the stairs, into the temple, visitors went. Behind the facade often lingered grand liminal spaces that openly speak of power, privilege and patronage, celebrating recently forged national identities and royal or imperial lineages. Vienna's Kunsthistorisches Museum and the Altes Museum in Berlin are just two prime examples of this 19th century practice. In Berlin's Altes Museum, the central double height rotunda was essential to the visitor experience. This liminal space functions as a break from the bustle of the city and the mundane every day. The rotunda aims to change the visitor's mindset, making them receptive to the contemplation of art that awaits them in the galleries beyond. The 19th century unfaltering belief in the educational value of art created the museum buildings that continue to dominate our city centers even today. These structures have experienced many changes and have sprouted new wings to accommodate an ever-growing range of visitor provisions. The National Gallery in London is no exception to that potted and palimpsestic history and will be my main example for this talk. Let's take a closer look at the existing entrances to the National Gallery. The 19th century entrance is marked by a central portico. The entrance hall is dissected by sets of stairs leading towards the gallery's two main wings and straight ahead into the main hall. In this early 20th century gallery plan, the collections are laid out roughly chronologically and by schools. The meandering itinerary, which I've outlined in light blue, 
begins and concludes in the main hall, indicated by the red circle at the centre of the building. It moves, the itinerary moves clockwise through the building's numbered gallery spaces. What Nick Sirota, the former director of Tate, has disparagingly called the conveyor belt of art history is enacted here. A walk through the history of Western painting from the Middle Ages to the late 19th century. The entrance played a crucial part in what Carol Duncan has termed the civilizing ritual, which organizes the main museum visit as an act of participation in a shared ideological space, be that civic or national, royal or imperial. A ritual of welcome brought the visitor upstairs to the first floor galleries via a sequence of architectural set pieces, portico, staircase, central hall, that spoke a shared language which was often unashamedly monumental. When working with the plans for the Sainsbury Wing, which opened in 1991, Denise Scott Brown referenced our era's discomfort with unalloyed monumentality. In true postmodernist fashion, she and Robert Venturi invoked a wide frame of historical references and offered an ironic inflection of this monumentality that was itself in place monumental. Take, for example, the staircase. It was placed pointedly off center but the ascent to the picture galleries recalls Rome's Scala Santa, which you see on the left hand of the screen, and still conceptualizes the museum visit as pilgrimage. Hewn into the stone cladding that flanks the steep stairs are the names of iconic master artists. You can just make out Bellini, Leonardo, and Raphael is cut off to the right of the screen. Um, these referenced an unchangeable canon of male grace. Ironic inflection wears thin here and continues to underwrite the traditional master narrative of art history. But let's return to the lobby for a moment. With its low ceiling and low light levels, the foyer of the Sainsbury Wing displayed the flair of the hotel lobby in a ski resort. Robust and protective against the elements, it was also rather uninviting. Not constructed as a space to linger, but configured as a space of subtle visitor manipulation. As in Berlin's Altes Museum, the foyer was conceived as a liminal space. Scott Brown spoke about the fact that the lobby's low light levels were preparing the eyes for the encounter with the art upstairs. Postmodernism allowed a playful interaction with the, with the historic structure. The architects deployed an assimilation of fragments which continued to draw on the elements of traditional museum architecture, offering an at times problematic exchange with the old building. Two decades on from this engagement with the National Gallery's old building, the design group has applied, who designed the signage for the gallery's new Getty entrance in 2013, diagnosed with ruthless clarity that, and I quote, the 19th century portico entrance was struggling to perform as a 21st century welcome, confusing visitors at the start of their viewing experience, unquote. What does it mean then to perform a 21st century welcome? The Getty entrance offered a practical yet cynical answer. The building gained a step-free central entry point, which you can see on the left-hand side of the screen. The pathway into the gallery and towards the art now leads narrowly past the shop and the cafe, which flank the, centra, the entrance and offer immediate distraction and familiarity. And I've highlighted them in red and red circles on the, on the plan. If the visitor resists the temptations of consumption and progresses into the Annenberg Court beyond, a staircase beckons, which takes them up to the gallery level. Here, the visitor arrives sideways into the 19th century vestibule. The complex space does not gain in clarity of circulation when traversed obliquely 
as my squiggle of red lines on the ground floor plan highlights. Instead of alleviating visitor confusion, the Getty entrance delays and ultimately aggravates it. It will fall to Zeldorf Architects, who won the competition to rework the Sainsbury Wing entrance to conclusively answer the question Finaldi asked, what should the visitor experience be? Well, we'll have to wait and see. Instead, I want to conclude with a quick look back at the old entrance, which although cumbersome and out of tune with 21st century needs and sensibilities, remains central to the understanding of the architecture of the National Gallery. The symbolic axiality that points beyond the building to Trafalgar Square, Whitehall and the Houses of Parliament situated the building in the city and the visitor at the heart of empire. These legacies need to be addressed and interrogated. They cannot simply be overwritten by practical concerns for visitor well-being and orientation. A true 21st century welcome will have to address these complex histories and to ensure that they don't become dead ends. I want to end with a question. How do we make old entrances and their rituals critically legibly, legible? for 21st century museum visitors. Only when we can answer this will we have created institutions capable of performing a true 21st century welcome. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Michaela Giebelhausen. And now, uh, we turn to Fue Santa Nieto, who is going to, uh, her title is Beyond the Concept of the Museum, about the Arvo Pat Center in Tallinn. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to start by saying thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this and thank you for organizing the seminar. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Luis. And, um, well, our practice has been uh, involved in the design of museums for the last years, and I guess I want to start by uh, seeing some of the museums because afterwards I'm going to discuss exhibition, I mean buildings for exhibition, but are not strictly called museums. So, uh, the Madinat Al Alzara Museum in Spain, for us, it's important to answer the question in a museum, how are we going to best exhibit uh, the collection? But at the same time, it's important for us also to understand how and where we are acting. So here in Madinat Alzara, we were also wanting to act with the landscape. By the way, here we work together with Juan Pablo Rodriguez Frade in the museography. Another museum in the city of Graz, where we created a public plaza and the museum and the extension was under it. Uh, the Contemporary Art Center, which is, has no collection, but the collection is being done by the artists in residence, and we wanted especially for the artists to react in the museum. Uh, working in, a, in protected buildings where we establish, try to establish a dialogue, a relation between the new and the existing architecture. Something that also happens in San Telmo in San Sebastian by uh, the new building relates in a different way to the open space behind or uh, even stepping back, back with the new architecture in buildings like the Castillo de la Luz, where we wanted to bring out all the history of the building, and even more in this one in Valladolid, when we really acted basically by restoration in recognition of the very important value of the building. We are now working in another two museums, in a, a, mon a monastery in the city in, in Catalonia, for the Carmen Thyssen collection of Catalan art, and in another one that we just won for the Fine Arts Museum in the city of Vannes. So now uh, I want to discuss uh, buildings for exhibition that are not strictly called museums. Uh, an archive for the avant-garde in Dresden, a house, the Mont Blanc House in Hamburg in Germany, and the center which gives name to this lecture, the Arbor Park Center in Estonia. The archive of the avant-garde is a, an amazing collection of this man, Elpidio Marzona, which has been collecting an impressive collection of more than one million objects that is, is uh, um, 
um, in different places in the city of Berlin when he lives, and in recognition of the importance of the collection, the city of Dresden here offered a building uh, to bring to Dresden the collection, the archive. This place was painted by Canaletto in the 18th century, and we try to make a photograph of nowadays with the same perspective. Apparently, they are different, but if you look carefully, you are going to see that in that painting of 1747, you find that building under construction, which is exactly the same situation that we had, the same building in which we are going to act two years ago before starting the construction. Something that speaks about the time that goes by through the buildings. Another thing, but it's very interesting in architecture. The building, this is an image of the building which we are, which we are acting that was finally built like this, image before the war, a very sad image after the war, and the building nearly destroyed was afterwards rebuilt very faithfully in the outside, but in the inside was simply an office building that was used until the building decided, I mean the city decided to give it to the collection of the archive of avant-garde. So what we did was we kept the outside and we freed the inside in a, in a cube, a, a free cube. We organized a new a slab, and a different uh, syst uh, communication, vertical communication system, and in the center of that slab with a void, a cube was going to be hanging in which we are going to uh, organize the avant-garde collection. That gave us a free um, ground floor which allowed to have a continuous space with the city uh, and other public space to the city that could organize any kind of uh, exhibitions or um, whatever you wanted to do there, like lectures, whatever, or even exhibitions like this one that is already organized about dancing. Uh, above that, and in the floating cube, we have the archives that can be, um, uh, the, uh, it can be visited and, and the elements can be checked in that new slab that we are creating. Also, in that way, we are able to uh, give it a higher, we, uh, we have the river very near, so we have to protect the collection by putting it higher than the water. Um, the, what we, the concept of this competition when we entered in it was really to stress the contrast between uh, the heaviness of uh, of the, uh, the heaviness, I mean, of the history against the lightness of the avant-garde. The building, a, a couple of months ago, in the month of February, we have a still a couple of months to go for it to finish, and we, I hope that in a near future, in a couple of months, maybe I can come back to tell you and to show you the finished building. Uh, the Mont Blanc House, uh, this was another competition to build the house for this company that builds these beautiful pens, and it has always been wanting to be the best. Uh, uh, even though I always thought it was Swiss, it's uh, German, and we, we, the place to build was this parking space in which in front of the industrial building in the, uh, an industrial area, Altona, in, the, in Hamburg, where they produce the pens. So what we decided to do was a longitudinal building that could give the old industrial building a new facade. Uh, the building was going to be separated from the rest of the parking space by a garden. And in, uh, we looked uh, to the pens, to the cases, to the beautiful cases that uh, they inside hold these iconic pens and that inside of them they had the um, very special, specific um, elements that can produce that beautiful writing. So this is the model that we presented to the competition, a longitudinal building with the same proportion as a case for the pens and that the inside had the complexity that we need to solve the building. The building uh, with a black concrete facade that was done in different layers by the movement that we wanted to trace the movement of the pen with the hand and the white interior organized around the central staircase that communicated the exhibition areas. The, white, uh, the exhibition starts in the communication in the stair with the dome above with the first part of the exhibit. 
outside the facade, the working drawings, and some images of the mock-up that we had, uh, a one-to-one -one mock-up, in order to see the difficulties of building the, this kind of facade. The building was opened uh, three weeks ago, a black concrete facade done in different layers, and each one of these different layers also has these uh, different, la um, different shadows, different, different uh, grades, I mean, in order to produce the different shadows. The entrance was done by a cantilever that in some of the areas is open to above in order to connect the different spaces from outside to inside a black exterior that connects, like the cases of the pen, to a white interior. When I'm saying a white interior, I'm talking about maybe different shades of white, because what I'm meaning to say is that we used most of the uh, materials of the building in different whites, like terrazzo, paper, and very uh, light wood. For here is the central, the central space, the central uh, communication space that uh, holds an exhibition really for writing. In this part of the building we have the exhibitions of pens and in the other part of the building is the exhibition of the different writings and the different contracts and special writings that these Mont Blanc pens have signed. Also how the pens are enabled to put together, and this very special area above the dome, like in the heart of the building, the center of the building, where they have this archive, where they hold all uh, the uh, initial Mont Blanc pens and also the materials and the way that they were doing and fabricating these pens. When we go to the facade outside again, and it's a facade that transforms also during the night by the shadow and by the light. A facade that, even though it's not uh, yet completely finished now, but it, that it can receive projections and can show also from the, to the outside what is happening in the inside. And finally, uh, a center. The, Arbo Part Center in Estonia. Arbo Part is uh, an incredible composer, and also in recognition, in recognition to his value, the um, government of Estonia decided to build a center for Arbo Part. For us, a project about architecture, landscape, and music. The center was built in this beautiful uh, peninsula, the peninsula of Laulasma, 40 kilometers away from the city of Tallinn, in these beautiful woods that are the place where the Arvo Park family, Nora and Arvo, uh, stay there during the months of the summer. Everything was special in this competition, even how they gave us a breeze in an espiral, something that we immediately connected to uh, the notations of Arbo Part, especially for Tabula Rasa, and we started working with this kind of geometry, pentagons organized around an espiral by the series of Fibonacci. We especially wanted in this building to connect with the music of Arbo Part, so we started working with a series of patios. And these patios connect with the silence in the music of Arbo, and for us, the patios were the silence in architecture. The building was placed in the more far away, in the more distant part of the plot in which we were working in order for the people to have to walk through the woods to get to the building. We looked for a space in which the wood had less trees, which was difficult with this kind of wood, in order for the building also to adapt with its shape. The floor plan in which the patios organized in the center organized all the public space. A second important element was a wall, an structural wall, that ran around all the building and separated the public and the private spaces. A third element, a floating roof. A floating roof that was going to be held over 
that structural wall. A continuous roof that with the different slopes was going to differentiate the more public and the more private spaces of the Arvo Park Center, of the foundation. And lastly, a facade, a facade organized of different columns with different widths and different rhythms in connection to the landscape. Drawings like this, uh, uh, our working drawings with the axis of the columns that really study the rhythm of the different columns that we have for the facade and that we want to connect or try to connect to the notations of Arvo Part and at the same time link it to the landscape outside. The facade organized with three different rhythms of columns, columns that are at the same time structural ones, mechanical others, and simply for the rhythm, the third ones. Working with the foundation and with Arvo, with these drawings, we superimposed our working drawings like this, which is a lighting plan, or simply directly the other plans that I showed you, the axis of the columns, establishing a series of relations that, of course, I guess are very personal to us, but that uh, were um, presented in a book that was presented the day of the uh, inauguration of the, Arbo of, of the Arbo Park Center. This is the day that the uh, building was laid out in the woods and uh, here we are in an image with Arvo Part. And uh, I'm showing these images because uh, what happened here is that uh, the family part, the Arvo Part family in the foundation, they really get, got very implied in everything, in the construction and in all the development of the project. Everything that was important was celebrated. Here, the finishing of the structure. And everything was celebrated with beautiful music. some images of the construction, and I'm showing this because really the implication of the part family and the foundation really created a sense of a team. And uh, the sense of the team made that everybody was happy to work here. Everybody from architects, engineers, everybody in the construction, and everybody was given their best and thinking that they were working for a wonderful place. And maybe, that is one of the reasons that the building was finished on time. The way that you got to the building is through the woods. As I said in the beginning, we traced a path through the woods. And after, we left also that the natural vegetation turned over it again. So simply, it's indicating the way to access the building. When you get to the building, you uh, uh, go, get to the facade that we try to, con uh, a facade that continues with the landscape, the relation to the landscape. The materials of the building are basically three, wood, steel, and glass. We use the wood for the more opaque facades, like the one of the auditorium, and the rest of the space, especially the exhibition areas, are done with glass. Windows is a, a fluid, flexible, continuous space that, uh, and we establish always a relation between the outside landscape and the inside landscape, the landscape of the patios in which we continue with the same kind of vegetation that we have in the outside. The other public areas, like the library, that are done in that wall that I showed you in the beginning, the continuous wall, a structural wall. The entrances to the different places is done in the places where the courtiers get together in a thin space, creating a thin space to enter. 
we go back to the entrance and we continue running along the structural wall, we get to a very special space in this center, the auditorium, thinking that it's a place for music. An auditorium that was conceived as a wooden box, even uh, the acoustical panels. The colors of the furniture in relation to the color of the wood outside. The acoustical panels were done especially for the music of Arvo Part by the Spanish engineer Eugene Arau. And I think that gladly he liked them. This is the day of the opening of the building in which Arvo took part, and I think that he was happy with the way that the building was sounding. This is a special room, the room of Arvo Part, and uh, uh, here he bought all the furniture that he had in his, uh, in his house in Berlin, where he was exilated from Estonia for many years. In the building, always we try to establish a relation to the outside, even in the auditorium where we had a big sliding door uh, and behind we have this big window in order to relate to the landscape. Also, from the roof, the light coming out and in through the different courtyards. In some of them, in some of the courtyards, we have special things like this very small chapel. Arvo and Nora are very religious and they wanted to have a chapel in the center. In the patios, really, you can understand all the concept of the building, like geometry, the relation to the outside, and the materiality. During the night, the light of the building, especially important in a place like Estonia, And the last element, a tower, because Arvopart wanted to be able to see the sea. The sea, which is very near, but we cannot see it because we are in the middle of a forest. So the only possible way to be able to see the sea is to build a tower that can go over the trees and look above them. So for that, we went back to the notations of Arvo Part. We started working with a pentagonal base and a tower that was going to be organized around the structure of uh, the same columns as the facade, tied together with a metal string. An empty tower that was only going to hold an stair, an elevator, and a platform above, from which Arvo Part can see the sea. And we hope that he can continue creating this beautiful music for a long time above looking to the sea. This is the image that we presented to the competition. And this is the final built building. For us, a project about landscape, music, and architecture. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this beautiful presentation.
We are now going to uh, the Alhambra Museum and the National Archaeological Museum, Interventions on Architectural Heritage. Juan Pablo Rodriguez Farada. The floor is yours now. Good afternoon. I would like to thank the Stockholm Association of Architects and the Spanish Embassy me to, for inviting me to participate on these lectures and share some thoughts with such a great team of participants. This particular field of architecture, we have always faced the following question. How to combine the respect for a highest grade listed building with the requirements of a 21st century museum? I believe the success of the intervention lies on the balance between two aspects, tradition and development. This is achieved by assuming certain sacrifices with the goal of maximizing the relationship between the building and the collection. Turning an historical building into a museum implies a series of very specific consideration towards the original traces of the building. It is crucial to take all these premises into account for the beginning of the design process. So we use the pre-existing as an advantage. The only way to guarantee architectural survival is to sure ensure its usage. We aim to merge both the motion transmitted by the old museums with the efficient communication and conservation requirements that new technology offers us. At the same time, we believe it's possible and exciting to recover all museographic strategies that today might seem outdated, but can be very interesting if they are interpreted from a contemporary point of view. In the end, it's about reaching a solution that can thrill and be suggestive without disrespecting the original project, creating a museum open to a wide range of audience, where every visitor feels it's been designed to its own interest and knowledge. The Alhambra Museum. Carlos Quinto Palace, 16th century, is located inside the Alhambra Fortress, 11th to 15th century, the most visited monument in Spain, about 2 million visitors per year. Its typology is based on a circular patio inscribed inside a square with a strong symbolic character as if the emperor stamped his mark over the Nazari Palace. The original building was never finished, and in the meantime, many uses were discussed. Military academy, head of a state residence, but it wasn't until 1940 when it was converted into administrative use. After receiving the commission, we did a deep research on the original building, finding pictures from 1920s where the palace was photographed without rooftop and slabs. We also found the original plants in the Royal Palace archives. Although it was a well-known topic by historians, the building seems like a stranger to the community, a building which construction started in 1526 and stayed unfinished. There are many buildings with this level of quality that never had a golden period. Therefore, we had very valuable documentation, rigorous technical plans of the original architect Machuca back for, from the 16th century, which reached out our days almost intact. By, all, by overlapping the original traces, and the current state of the building, it was easy to recognize which elements were in original. Due to poor, poor value, we decided to demolish them leaving only the original 16th century elements that gave the building its monumental character. Criteria. This year, these are the main principles we follow on the renovation, which I consider that can be applied to any other heritage building. One, historical analysis. Compile all information available about the original building to understand the logic of whom precedes. Two. Authenticity, value, perhaps the most important topic. What is authentic, the oldest, the most relevant? What happens when different styles overlap? Baroque traces over Renaissance typologies, 
or Christian structures over Islamic buildings such as Cordoba's mosque. It was recently found that there was an old painting by Uruguayan painter Torres Garcia under a painting by Pablo Picasso. How to proceed? Erase Picasso's work because Torres Garcia was previous. Leave Picasso? It is a matter of criteria. In our case, it was obvious that the Spanish post war in 1940 addition had a simple functional purpose mezzanines, toilets, storage with no architectural value. So we decided to demolish them. Three, avoid pastiche. Use of contemporary language, sober but settled in our era. Four, movable assets. As far as possible, any intervention must be reversible. And five, design and construction documentation. Keep track of all the actions to guarantee maintenance and conservation of the building. We discover multiple elements, the same by Machuca 500 years ago, that never got built, but they will have given extra value to the building. The aerial photo and the original plants help us throughout this process. Some examples. You can see in the pictures, we, cast, we discovered the opening for the mezzanine that never got built. We discover also the staircase which connect Carlos V Palace with the Nazari palaces, an extremely symbolic stair linking the different patio typologies. People refer to it as the stair of time. An old irrigation ditch from the 13th century was found. It used to supply water to the palaces, and it helped us configuring the exhibition speech using this room to talk about water and the Alhambra. Integrating MEP is usually one of the trickiest aspects of heritage renovation, but in this case, the existing building played in our favor. We used the old slabs openings on the walls that were never used to conduct all the ducts and trays. In a project like this, security strategies are as demanding as in a bank branch. A strict climate control solutions are similar to a hospital. 20 degrees Celsius, 50% relative humidity, very specific lighting control. We, begin, we began with the museography. Our aim was to explain Alhambra history in a chronological order. In order to establish a balance between chapters, we set up parallel speeches in every room. We were able to show a wide range of pieces domestic to architectural artifacts, plaster works, timber works, tiles. In renovation of, of historical building, the modern movement leitmotif forms follow function, inverts its orders of function follows form. The collection narrative should be defined based on the available rooms. Museography, the more valuable the building is, the lower museographic load should be. In this case, both the container and the content are highly valuable. There is an interesting interpretation of the building that once was crushing the Nazarene construction and now is working as a big showcase presenting the, cultural, the culture it once has buried. In the center of the room, you can see the original Lindaraja fountain and a copy was created to leave it outdoor. It's a common practice nowadays, protecting original and using copies on their original locations. This opens another debate, the importance of the copy and the original. A space with no value that once they get rid of unnecessary partitions come back to life allowing the visitor to enjoy its original value. Here you see the before and after of this room. Museum. Space with no value that once they get rid, oh, sorry, a museum that helps the visitor to understand the building history. Now, I'm going to briefly explain the National Archaeological Museum renovation. 
in June that went from 200,000 visitors per year prior to the renovation to 1 million the year after it. And what is more important, it changed the audience profile, not only from an academic background, but also families and teenagers. The National Archaeological Museum was created in 1876 by the Queen Isabel II with the purpose of keeping the numismatic, archaeological, ethnographic, and decorative art collections gathered by the Spanish monarchs of the Austrian and Bourbon houses. The building received the listed building highest rating in 1983. Since it was, it was built, it has gone throughout multiple interventions and functional restructuring. The last one, in 1968. The building was conceived as a public library and museum, being the first building in Madrid supported by an iron structure. The plant traces are full of symbology. The art collection in the perimeter is protecting the treasures of the library in the central cross, so the tangible objects guard the serial knowledge from war, noise, lies, light, and dirt. With time, the different uses were reconfigured, ending up with a more diffuse border between the library and the museum. Prior to the renovation, the building suffered of several issues to resolve. Accessibility problems, lack of an appropriate reception space, obsolete museum narrative, unbalanced museography language, inadequate offices, outdated facilities need to adapt to a new regulation on fire protection. So we propose recover all the space below the rooftop, access and course adapt to the current accessibility and security regulation, a structural refurbishment, refining the interior layout, new welcoming space, auditorium and temporary exhibition rooms. The aim was to amend the existing pathologies based on the respect to the heritage, avoiding frivolous interventions. Now, I would like to speak about nostalgia in, our, in, in architecture. This is a very important topic. One, during one visit to the New York Archaeological Museum, an elderly woman pointed that she missed the museum she once visited with her parents back in the 50s. But probably what she was missing was being 60 years younger. As we usually say, when we miss our childhood summertime, we don't miss the town, but childhood itself. In architecture, to save buildings time-proof, they must be constantly updated in order to guarantee its performance. We maintain the original monument entrance, so it could be used if needed. At the same time, we propose a new strategy in terms of access due to several reasons, making it accessible to disabled audience without affecting the main front view, and what's more important, leaving the noble rooms for the collection and relocating secondary uses such as auditorium, storage, cafe, and shop to the underground levels. Here is the new access. We want to follow what the masters taught us. The gates to churches, museums, and palaces should have vertical proportion so each person and his dignity could walk through one by one. The design is opposite to the horizontal entrance you can find in every shopping mall. Museum program is very aggressive towards an illicit building. It's crucial to implement, implement it with all services required by a 21st century institution. The artistic challenge is hiding the effort behind the work. This is a photo also of José Manuel Ballester, th the third one. The total closure of the museum for a long period of time would mean unlinking the community from a museum that is widely consolidated in the cultural life of the city. Therefore, it's important to find a way to keep some of act its activities during the construction works. This is achieved by splitting the works into several stages, even though it will delay the process. The project increased the main uses, both public and internal. It was necessary to incorporate a wide welcoming area 
that allows an appropriate circulation. They will come in space. This main hall will also be the new public image of the institution. Some uses incorporated on this space can remain open even when the museum is closed, cafe, shop, etc. This support the financing model of the museum and reinforce the connection of the institution with the community, the market prior to the temple. The renovation concludes with an optimization of the available area. 30,000 square meters with a ratio of one third is for admin, back of house, and other secondary uses such as auditorium, cafe, and shop. 10,000 square meters. One third is permanent exhibition displaying one percent of the collection, about 15,000 pieces over 1.5 million in total. And the last third, MEP and storage. The roofs over the patio were dismantled back in the 50s, and our design recovers the original typo typology of a roof patio. It is a classic typology from 19th century museums. And by recovering it, we extend the available area for collection not affected by sunlight. It's a way to respect the original building without undermining the contemporary character of the intervention. This picture shows the Roman and Iberian collection. Museography is the discipline that establishes a relationship between container, content, and visitor. We base our design in the following principles. One, relationship with the container, especially with a building that was conceived as a museum. Two, time proof. It's important to avoid ephemeral trends it should be conceived to last. Technology is integrated in it, but always as a medium. And three, flexible. Collection grow and the museum narrative changes. So the museography should be adaptable, minimizing cost. The older the era to be displayed is, the more interpretation strategies are meant to be used. This is a history museum, not only archaeological from prehistory to 19th century. It talks about the Beric Peninsula before it was called Spain and all the cultures that form who we are. The beautiful model of the Cordoba Mosque works as a ceiling to create a special atmosphere on the Islamic room, inspired by the Nasri Palace decoration. Much has been said about museography's neutrality, but the truth is that every museography space we remember with interest isn't neutral. The Victoria Samo is at the Louvre, Castelvecchio, Sir John Swan Museum in London, the Dulwich Gallery. Artworks weren't conceived to be displayed in museums and also not to be so close one to the other. Museography must control that energy that comes out from these relationships. Thelma Schumacher, is an American film editor known for her over 50 years of work with director Martin Scorsese, editing films such as Raging Bull, Goodfellas, and Casino. When asked how it was that such a nice lady could edit Scorsese violent movies, Thelma replied with a smile, well, but they aren't violent until I have edited them. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Before we move on to our next speakers, I want to say that there is no evening without a surprise. And um, I think the surprise this evening is that uh, the next presentation will actually be in Spanish. Because I think there was a hidden, this is, a, it wasn't meant to be, but I think, it's, it's a gift to us who don't speak Spanish. So now we've got the first delightful occasion to, to get a little bit of 10 minute training in this. So I leave the floor now to uh, Victor and uh, Leticia and the intervention in the Villanueva building to house the treasure of the 
Dauphin collection, right? Buenos días, es un honor representar al Museo Nacional del Prado en este encuentro hispano-sueco que se celebra en Estocolmo sobre arquitectura y museografía. Saludo a mis colegas españoles y suecos y les mando un abrazo desde esta galería central del edificio que Juan de Villanueva diseñó por encargo del rey Carlos III a finales del siglo XVIII en el centro de la ciudad de Madrid para Museo de Ciencias Naturales. La relación entre la arquitectura y la museografía ha sido muy íntima y lo es todavía en el Museo Nacional del Prado. Y para poder explicaroslo, nos vamos a desplazar, mi compañera Leticia Azco y yo, a dos espacios importantes dentro de este museo. Las salas de historia del museo y las salas del tesoro del rey. Estamos en las salas de historia del museo y de sus edificios, las salas 100, 101 y 102 del Museo del Prado, que son eh, los únicos espacios de semisótano que diseñó Juan de Villanueva y que se conservan en la actualidad. Fueron transformadas a, hace aproximadamente un año en salas de historia del museo, donde se cuentan las vicisitudes que fue siguiendo esta institución de la mano de su arte. Y aquí se puede comprobar con muchísima claridad cómo la arquitectura del museo ha ido cambiando, transformándose, ampliándose, por muchas circunstancias, pero en gran parte para responder a las exigencias de las colecciones y a los nuevos gustos en materia de museografía. La primera gran transformación que se produjo en el edificio de este museo tuvo lugar en el propio inicio del mismo, cuando fue creado como Museo Real de Pinturas en noviembre de 1819, a iniciativa del rey Fernando VII y de su esposa Isabel de Braganza. El edificio del museo había sido creado, como habíamos dicho anteriormente, a finales del siglo XVIII por iniciativa de Carlos III y encargo a Juan de Villanueva para acoger un gabinete de Historia Natural y una Academia de Ciencias Naturales. El edificio quedó inacabado a finales de la Guerra de la Independencia y fue escogido por el rey Fernando VII para alojar un nuevo museo, en este caso de arte. Para diseñar esta transformación, esta rehabilitación del edificio, el rey Fernando VII encargó un proyecto a Antonio López Aguado, el arquitecto que tengo representado en un busto a mis espaldas y que era heredero de Juan de Villanueva. Antonio López Aguado diseñó una transformación de esa arquitectura que no solo finalizó el edificio que había permanecido inacabado, sino que modificó algunos eh, aspectos para poder exponer pintura donde antes se había pensado exponer especímenes de ciencias naturales. Durante los primeros diez años de funcionamiento del museo fue incrementándose el número de salas abiertas a, al público. El criterio de exposición era, como era habitual en los museos del siglo XIX, la acumulación. Las pinturas tapizaban las paredes de, de suelo a techo. Pero, sin embargo, a finales del siglo XIX el criterio museográfico cambió. Y es aquí donde vemos una de las principales influencias que las corrientes museográficas tuvieron en la modificación de la arquitectura del museo. A finales del siglo XIX y principios del siglo XX comenzaron a surgir en el Museo del Prado las primeras salas dedicadas a escuelas pictóricas y grandes maestros, donde el criterio expositivo ya no fue la acumulación, sino la selección de las mejores piezas y la exposición a la altura de la vista. Por lo tanto, en los mismos espacios arquitectónicos podían exponerse muchas menos piezas. Comenzó entonces una gran presión en el Museo Nacional del Prado para ampliar y modificar su arquitectura con la intención de poder acoger más salas que pudiesen exponer las colecciones con estas características museográficas. En torno al año 1914, el recién creado Real Patronato del Museo Nacional del Prado reunió fondos para la realización de la primera gran ampliación que diese respuesta a esa exposición. 
exigencias museográficas. Se diseñaron unas crujías paralelas a la galería central que había diseñado Juan de Villanueva, lo que distorsionó la circulación inicial generando una circulación en ocho en torno a esta gran eh, sala central. A esa primera transformación sucedieron otras posteriormente, en los años 50 y en los años 60 del siglo XX, que fueron realizando crujías paralelas y adosadas a las iniciales, con lo cual la arquitectura que había desarrollado y había diseñado Juan de Villanueva quedó profundamente transformada. La última gran ampliación, como saben, fue obra de Rafael Moneo. Además de esta gran ampliación inaugurada en el año 2007 y diseñada por Rafael Moneo, que dotó al Museo Nacional del Prado de importantes espacios, tanto públicos como internos, que han mejorado muchísimo el funcionamiento museístico de la institución, el museo ha desarrollado en los últimos años actuaciones museográficas concretas en espacios arquitectónicos determinados para la mejor exposición y conservación de sus colecciones. Uno de los últimos ejemplos ha sido la transformación de la Galería Jónica en Sala de Escultura y también en 2018 la transformación del Toro Norte ubicado en torno a la cúpula del volumen de Goya para Sala del Tesoro del Delfín. La última intervención arquitectónica y museográfica ha sido esta Galería Jónica inaugurada en mayo de 2022. Esta galería recupera el uso que se le dio en el siglo XIX cuando en 1881 se abrió como galería de escultura para mostrar parte de las colecciones reales que forman eh, las colecciones del Museo del Prado y recupera también la relación con la ciudad a través de eh, estos ventanales abiertos al Paseo de, del Prado que en el siglo XIX ni siquiera tenían cristaleras, era una galería de paseo. En 2018 se hizo una intervención total a este espacio del edificio que originalmente en el siglo XIX era una terraza, se remodeló completamente, se cambiaron los solados, el techo y se recuperó un espacio eh, para un nuevo destino que era la ubicación del Tesoro del Delfín, una colección de artes suntuarias de los siglos XVI y XVII fundamentalmente que perteneció al hijo de Luis XIV y que eh, heredó su hijo eh, Felipe V, el primer Borbón de España. Trata de un proyecto museográfico que pensamos que es pionero. Son 40 metros continuos en casi una elipse, probablemente el espacio museográfico más largo eh, con este diseño que se encuentra hoy en el mundo, pensamos, y que ha tenido todos los estudios previos para tener las mejores condiciones de conservación. Dada la delicadeza extrema de todas estas obras, muchas de ellas en cristal de roca, eh, se ha cuidado con esmero eh, la estabilidad, de manera que todas las baldas están probadas para que en ningún momento pueda haber ninguna vibración que pueda afectarles. Y se han hecho estudios también de eh, la iluminación para que cada una tenga una iluminación específica y una altura correcta para su visión eh, necesaria en cada caso. Varias de las eh, obras se han expuesto en vitrinas exentas para que se puedan apreciar desde todos los puntos de vista y se ha desarrollado una aplicación que se puede encontrar eh, por internet también eh, para poder ver cada pieza individualmente desde todos los puntos de vista ampliadas a la máxima resolución y con la historia eh, particular, con su estuche y con... se ha procurado poner en valor cada una de las piezas de manera independiente, de forma que el visitante pueda disfrutarlas si solo quiere contemplarlas pero tenga toda la información posible en la parte inferior que no compite con la, con la pieza y cada eh, sección tiene una pequeña introducción para que el visitante entienda las claves de cada uno de los grupos que hemos eh, organizado en esta exposición permanente. 
Eh, este es un ejemplo de la relación de la arquitectura con la museografía, cómo la nueva museografía, por un lado, ha recuperado y puesto en valor los restos arquitectónicos, como la cornisa que se ve en la parte superior, que es el testimonio del de trabajo de Villanueva en 1819, y por otro lado, el destino de un nuevo uso que ha recuperado un espacio para exhibir una de las colecciones más importantes de artes suntuarias del Museo Nacional de Thank you. I think um, we got uh, a first taste, uh, us who don't speak Spanish, to uh, an incitement to learn. Um, and I'm sure that you picked up one or two words. And um, we will, of course, we will, of course, in the uh, documentation from this, you will be. Uh, you will be able to access the whole uh, the whole presentation in in with subtitles. Now we have our last um, our last presentation uh, before we open for the floor for questions, and it's Manuel Fontan. It's also a recorded, but it's in English. Hello, thank you all for being here. And thanks to the organizers of this symposium to which I have been invited to present some ideas on digital exhibitions. As we all know, uh, the so-called digital exhibitions are one of the new ways of exhibiting that the digital transformation of the world has produced. At the Fundación Juan Marc, we have developed three of such exhibitions in the last two years. As I only have seven minutes, I will just try to explain what I think digital exhibitions essentially are and why do they make sense. Basically, any exhibition needs, besides an idea of course, artworks and documents, a space and a curator. These three elements in conventional exhibitions have a physical material reality. Together, they produce exhibitions that take place in physical spaces with original artworks. As institutions organize a lot of exhibitions, it is usual to invite curators to curate these shows. And that is why we usually use the term guest curator. If the exhibition doesn't take place in real life, but is a digital or visual one, you continue to need these three elements just with a different quality. You do not need artworks, but you need the digital files of the artworks to be shown. You do not need a three-dimensional space, but you need a digital one. And of course, you still need a curator. My point is simple. When you make a digital exhibition, the curator, as the artworks, essentially change register. His or her job is no longer that of guest curating. It becomes an exercise in what we may call ghost curating. You do not curate artworks, but it's ghost. Digital exhibitions lose the physical experience of the materiality of artworks because from the very beginning, they can only include their digital images, whose virtual nature makes them like ghosts and spirits. For this reason, the relevant question about <clears throat> digital exhibitions is whether it makes sense to talk to ghosts, at least from time to time, or not at all. In my opinion, it does make sense. And I will try to clarify now why, using as an example our first digital exhibition, the Mondrian case. Let's begin with that expression, digital exhibition. And let's try to think 
for a moment in this expression, a digital kiss. A digital kiss would obviously be digital, but would it be a kiss? And what about a digital exhibition? Would it be an exhibition? If accurate, the expression digital exhibition should have a specific meaning. For me, to begin with, it should be ruled by the idea that in no way it tries to substitute a sensorial material experience that can only occur in the physical world where artworks live. And come on, we don't really need those substitutes. The world, our world, is already full of impressive experiences. We already live in a world of virtual reality, artificial intelligence, incredible, incredible video games, and soon to be sophisticated parallel worlds as metaverso. In such a digital virtual world, the question is not whether a digital exhibition can plausibly emulate what happens in material reality. The question is whether it is worth summoning digital reproductions of absent artworks, that is, their ghosts and spirits, to concentrate on looking, listening, and talking to those ghosts. And what does Pete Mondrian, the hero of our first digital exhibition, have to do with this kind of ghost world? A lot, actually. For example, Mondrian, whose geometric work is always present to us with an almost scientific appearance, strongly believed in spirits. He joined the Theosophical Society, founded by Madame Blavatsky in the photo, as early as 1909. Mondrian's appearance in many photographs, as in this one, is more that of a mystic with a vision that goes beyond the material world than that of an experimenter with geometric grids structuring primary color fields. And this is one of the reasons why Pete Mondrian seemed to me to embody the fact that a digital exhibition is nothing but a kind of spirited seance, a spirited session. A digital exhibition is a medium through which what is being called to congregate in a particular place of our global world wide web are not the original artworks or the material remains and traces of an artist's life. It is the digital files of those works and of that life that are summoned, their spirits or ghosts. Because the materiality of the original works is absent from the digital world, the differences between digital curation and curation between digital exhibitions and exhibitions in real life are radical. And therefore, trying to emulate the experience of the latter is not as interesting as relying in, on our specific interactivity with the digital, different from our interaction with the material world. Because internet, the digital space where we live, is not a curated space, Digital exhibitions are of no value if they are not, in the first place, places where the contents without apparent hierarchies or order, typical of the internet, can be articulated in new curated spaces that allow for meaningful comparisons and sequences. Digital exhibitions are nothing more, but also nothing less than imaginary museums, like the one once imagined by Malraux that digitally order mountains of images, words, and signs that curate visual images of works of art. They do not include, and therefore, they cannot show these artworks, but they can curate their images with a freedom one only has when dealing with spirits. I'm finishing. The relevance of digital exhibitions and imaginary museums is the same as the relevance of exhibitions and museums in real life. But because our world is increasingly also a digital one, its curation is perhaps even more necessary today than the curating of our old material physical reality. At the beginning, I asked if it made sense to talk to ghosts. I said it did. And for that reason, I think that digital exhibitions make sense. I would add to this now that whether talking to ghosts makes sense or not, the fact is that nowadays we are doing it all day long. We are all day summoning ghosts and talking with them, 
Every time we log on to the internet, we enter a ghostly world of images and discourses. We can't be sure if these images, signs or texts are right or not, if they are garbage or knowledge, if they are authentic or fake, bullshit or valuable, true or, or false. To sum up, we don't know if they are ghosts or real. To distinguish them, we need to curate also the digital world. And in this sense, digital exhibitions are just one little part of a bigger challenge, that of humanizing the last of man's extensions in the age of the digital, the artificial, and perhaps the post-human, an age where the trust in what we see and here is perhaps more fragile than ever before. Many thanks. Wow. Can I invite our um, non-ghost uh, <laughs> participants to uh, take the chairs on the stage? We have a few minutes, uh, I believe, do we? Yes, we have, we, we do have 11 minutes, it's fantastic. <laughs> 11 minutes of life. Yes, or oh, yesterday's uh, speakers, of course. Yes, uh, no, well, both of them maybe. <laughs> right. Um, can we, I want to ask the audience if um, there is any question or reaction. First I want to ask the audience the, the presently here that you, you have been served a lot of thoughtful and um, extraordinary presentations, I must say. Um, I myself, I'm struck by um, the uh, rigor and robustness and integrity in the physical projects that, were, that have been presented these two days. Um, and uh, I have some thoughts about this um, integrity of architecture and the robustness of it uh, in its material presence um, and how that robustness can survive change and change in program and change in our conditions. I don't know if you noticed today that I actually changed the room. It's different from yesterday. I raised the uh, blinds because, uh, and we're a little less, you know, uh, tired because of that and everyone looks even more beautiful. And, and we are influenced by that very much. And maybe in a time with scarcity, do we have to rethink also the museums as being actors in uh, beyond, beyond the museum in, with different changes? I, I think the museums are the new churches, but that's a kind of personal. <laughs> People go to them for a gap in time, right? Uh, outside of themselves. And I'm thinking of these uh, edifices that you have shown these two days have an extraordinary presence and integrity. And uh, I'm just curious to know um, your attitude to, to change within them. And, and maybe change um, to, uh, that they could take on even, how can they survive in a, in a very, stressed world is uh, basically my question. Would like to take this one. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, it's, it's very different, from my point of view, very different. An historical building with a very precise uh, collection that is fixed because it's something that is in the past, no? that happened in the past, but now we have the remains. And then you have to keep them 
as uh, better as possible. And then you have a creator to give you a lot of uh, instruction about how to show all these uh, remains of the, uh, of the past. No? I think this is very read, and then when you work in a very precise work, in a very precise way with the curator, then everything is, at the end is very fixed. But when you, you are talking about a contemporary art, I think from my point of view, and in the building that I have already, I have shown, uh, everything can change. And, then, uh, and I have to confess that at the beginning, when Rafael Doctor, the curator that I saw in the, in the pictures, uh, I started to work to deal with the building, I was a little afraid because he was introducing a track in the middle of a, of a gallery or uh, dismounting, taking out the glasses and putting another message in the facade and changing, uh, changing everything. And at the beginning I felt a little uncomfortable with this situation, but at the end I understood perfectly what he was trying to do with the building. The building at the end the, the Musak is something that is connecting with people, connecting with the city. It's a kind of endless conversation, public conversation. It's an um, endless research about the, the, the life and art contemporary. And then, uh, contemporary. then uh, everything is able to change. But it's completely different when you are dealing with a historical building that you have to be very careful. It's, it's precise and very sensitive with the creators, with the people, trying to measure every single change in order not to bother the, the, the art and the... This is my point of view. There is so many topics that talk about museum that hey, this moment because because there is so different museum from a museum like the Reichs in which there is a precise collection to show. There is a museum like the Musac in which there is not a precise collection. Nothing. It's nothing. The other building that. Santa has showed that more than the museum are a special building for one event. Okay. What I find is interesting in the Musac Museum is how they have been able to maintain a character in the interior of the pieces without disturbing the facility to integrate it, plenty of things. I think that it's very clear you had you had work with the roof, it's very clear. But what is more interesting is to work with the walls and with this slope change of direction that give a strong character and typical character to the museum without this turbine that you can do there a lot of things. I see today very clearly what is the the big goal of, the, uh, of your project. And then the work, of what I can say on the work of Fuenzanta is so delicate, it's so sensible in different theme that you, you had to do. It's a, it's a theme that we can talk and talk and talk. But I, am not, I, am, I don't agree with you that the museum at the cathedral of today. I think that the cathedral of today are the, are the stadiums. Sorry? The stadiums are the cathedral of today. Ah, the you're probably right. Because it's where there is a common yeah. sensation, a 
common experience between a lot of people looking for what they say is the essential of the, the more uh, sacrado, no? Thank you. We have another question in the audience. Uh, we will all have to speak within in, into the microphone. Uh, thank you for these two days and uh, great lectures. And my name is Veronica, and um, I love visiting uh, Spain and looking for good architecture. I love Spanish architecture. My last experience is from uh, Mallorca and La Palma and the uh, Contemporary Art Museum there. And I appreciated very much the outdoors there. Uh, and the connection between inside and outside. And now when I was listening to you, I a bit wonder about how you deal with the outdoors. Uh, today, Mr. Sorry for saying your name wrongly, Junior, uh, or Emilio, uh, showed a picture about what could happen outside, but I actually uh, didn't see any uh, architectural design, outdoors design in, in what I can remember, any of this lecture. So how you, do you deal with the architectural design outdoors? Like places, meeting places, uh, places for exhibitions outdoors. Okay. Uh, if, I, if I talk about the museum, the museum, this lecture was just a part of the of the museum, and uh, it's very interesting because the the, the museum has a, a big, it's, it's very in a, in a small uh, block, and it's getting to the end of the block with some trees, but there is a big space, a big plaza, where uh, is the, the public space that I was talking about. That this was the place where. Uh, a lot of things uh, are happening in this, in this performance, uh, concerts, parties, but uh, they are very carefree in the way that they are using the museum and they open the, the doors and there is a huge uh, door like this room that opens and the museum is like a street. Because one of the ideas at the beginning was to build a kind of a street in which the art can be in the interior or in the exterior, because 50% uh, of the time it's possible to, to not to use air conditioning in, in, in Leon. And then the, the idea was to mix the interior and the exterior. They're not using that, that much, but they use it from time to time. But this, from my point of view, is more interesting. They, they, they have a, a library and an a, a auditorium that they are using a lot, but they prefer, the auditorium is for 100 people, but they since the music has been a, a really important change in the uh, in the this small city, Leon, 100,000 people, and, and it's, a, it's a, say a a place where everything ha is happening there, and then but there are a lot of people that goes. They usually use, as I already shown, the lobby that is possible to to get to at the end. Uh, it's possible to, get, uh, to set uh, 300 people that is a big auditorium and they are trying to use the interior as exterior and the exterior as, as interior and they are working with all the spaces even the city because there many of the performances are not in the square but are in the old part of the city trying to connect these two centers of the city that now are the, the historical one and this one that is in the outer skirts but is trying to potence to reinforce the, the this area that is extension of the 2000. I, I should leave you. I will take that one. And we, we should use them as, as if we were going to drink a glass of wine. So as close to the glass. Uh, more questions? Do you have a question? Uh, thank you very much. It was very interesting for me. I'm not an architect, but a musician. And I was very impressed by your description of the Tallinn project with Arvo Pert. Um, 
And I have a question. Arvo Pert in, in the musical world is considered as a kind of retrospective uh, composing. Uh, his music is looking at the Renaissance and the Baroque music uh, in, a, in a very particular and personal way, of course. And uh, I, I'm wondering if you uh, thought about this when, when you build your project, because I, I understood that the, the graphic part of, of his composing is there and of the nature and all these things. but. The music itself, Spiegel im Spiegel, for instance, uh, in which way you had it in consideration when you uh, made your your project? Well, um, we were learning really with Arbo Part because when we started uh, when we started to work with him, we really, um, not being a musician, we did try to understand what he was doing, and it was by working with him. I mean. Uh, he told us that the way that he started to compose was through the Bible, and that uh, normally what he what he was doing is like he he ch chose uh, sentences or he chose specific words or he was uh, as I as I said in the in the presentation, both of them are very religious, so he he chooses special words, special sentences, and through it then he makes the compose the composition. So for us, it was like trying to understand how did he choose it, what what was the things that he chose, and we were trying to put those things into into our architecture. It's of course it's very personal. It's easy when when you can see his notations. For me, his notations are really beautiful drawings. I, I had never seen notations as those notations. So and for us, being architects, I mean uh, that we don't work so much with sound and. Um, shy of saying that, I would like to understand more of music, but it was easier to work with, with uh, and to rely and to relate to the notations, to relate to his words, and, and to try to, to, it was more like he was guiding us and he, we were trying to understand what, where he was trying to, to take us with our architecture, because he did. Um, for example, I have not shown it there because I didn't have enough time, but when we laid the building on the, on the forest, for example, uh, Arvo Part, I don't know if you've met him, but he's a very wonderful, natural man, and he he very easy to to talk to him. So when we were laying the building, I mean, when we were drawing the building in the ground, he was like unhappy, and I was like asking, but why? What is wrong? What are you seeing that is wrong? And he was telling me, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if if we have to turn the building around because I'm not sure if we are going to see the right thing through the window of the auditorium because it was exactly that window, and he wanted to see a specific thing. So we did try to turn the building. You cannot imagine how difficult it is to move a building when it's thought of, especially in a specific situation. It's very difficult, and we were there sitting with him and trying to to work with it. And I mean, he, 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 he was like working with us and he was saying, now I understand that working with uh, architecture or working with music is the same. We never finish, we can always go on. <laughs> See our drawings of that moment, it was like one floor plan, another one, another one, another one, another one. It was like a butterfly, I don't know. So many drawings on top of each other. I'm trying to... But, but I think the question, uh, if I understand it, is were you also looking towards the past? as Arbo parties in your architecture or not? Were you no. obliged? Uh, no. right, right. <laughs> if the question was that exactly looking to the past, no. We were looking to Arbo Part and we were looking to the present of Arbo Part and how he was dealing with his music now in, in, in the sense of what he was producing now. Did I answer correctly? <laughs> Thank you. No, if I may say something, of course, it's, it's, uh, we can consider them cathedrals or chapels or whatever, and we can think that art is the religion of our time or perhaps sport, as you think. But in any case, I think, uh, unfortunately, or oh, fortunately, who knows, who knows? No, I think we cannot answer this in a, in a, in a single direction. What I feel is that uh, every building, every commission is a different, uh, is, is, is a different problem. You said very well that you need discrimination, that you cannot apply the same rule, you know, to a historic building, to a great historical collection, you know, be the Rec Museum, you know, or the, or the Archaeological Museum, or else something that is completely um, 
created anew, like uh, in your case, you know, a museum for a musician in, 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 a, in a virgin land, or in yours, you know, to create this, this new building with no collection and even no direction. You, you didn't have a director. You didn't know what, what was expected of you there. So every, every single one of your different projects, you know, they were excellent. They were very well explained here. I think uh, I, I myself, as, uh, as part of the audience, uh, was, was enchanted, you know, to, to know in more detail your work. But each of it is one of a kind. We, we cannot make uh, any kind of uh, general reflections. So let's make a summary. I cannot, because I, I will have to discuss each and every one of them in its own merits. So this is perhaps, uh, if there is only one, if, if I may take your role of, of summing up, if I would only say is that uh, each uh, building, each commission is a different story. Needs a, a, a different approach and, uh, and a different uh, storyteller. And this is what these architects here have done. Um, all of them are Spaniards, but two of them working uh, in Spain and the other two working abroad. But in every single case, they have used their talent and their discrimination to offer different examples and different answers to different uh, questions. And, and thank you for, for moderating this, Joao. It's an excellent, <laughs> it's an excellent, excellent summing up, I think. Yeah, and if there are no more... Oh, there is a question there. So. Thank you. Oh, wow, this is loud. Sorry. Thank you so much, everybody, for your wonderful presentations. And I was just wondering, after hearing this vast variety of projects, both uh, working with historical buildings and uh, previous iterations that you have maybe decided to tear down or to replace and choosing what layers are important to keep and what layers not and also with brand new projects from scratch. I was wondering towards the future maybe or towards future generations of architects, how do you feel about your own projects or your own interventions to existing buildings about you know, another generation coming in and saying something has to change because the needs have evolved and whether maybe you feel differently if it has to do with a new building. You know, how do you feel about your new buildings being iterated somehow in the future? Or how do you feel about your new layers of, of, of these buildings transforming again? Somebody coming in in the future and saying, you know, this, this was maybe a mistake. No, not saying that it is, but in the same way that you have been able to determine that this was some things maybe weren't good. Uh, changes or necessary or they destroyed history that shouldn't have been destroyed and you bring things back. How do you feel about your own projects, which are very different of course, but even if you were to able, able to see within your lifetime, you know, in the next couple years, some other people coming in to do something not with you, completely independent, you know, in the same way that you have been also individuals with these buildings, like how do you, yeah, what do you think about your own projects changing or adapting or yeah that's kind of my question i guess really again i think that we have to at least i have to answer that it really depends a lot uh, i think that the building has to change and the buildings are born to change if you have if you have seen also in, in i don't know if, if this is working anyway if no no uh, it is okay so if you have seen for example in in in, in my presentation uh, that the building in which we are acting was already there in 1747 and it was in the same way as it was a couple of years before. I think that the building stays during the time and it has to change and it will change and it will have to adapt to the times that, to the times that are coming. But I think the way to do it is to try to understand the initial idea that generated the building. I think, really, that if we try to understand the concept of how the building was first designed or first built, and you try to continue with the same idea, you are not going to harm the building. You are simply going to write another chapter in the history of that building. So if it's correctly done, no problem at all, I think, is what it has to happen to buildings. 
the end, I think, uh, I think uh, you are correct, you know, that uh, buildings are books with many authors and they change in time. You, uh, those of you that have worked, you know, in historical buildings know that you are only one of a continuity of authors. And uh, in the end, this kind of, uh, you are obliged to feel very humble because you are only part. You, you have followed the work of others and your work will be followed again by uh, future architects. But perhaps a, a good way to finish this conversation as beyond this, this is being transmitted and many young people are listening to you, would you give a word of advice to young architects? And uh, may I, may I uh, Elizabeth, to ask uh, each, this of is them, a... each of them to give a word of advice yes. to young architects? Yes, this is, will be the concluding commentary. Of course, architects, yeah, yes, you are, you are right, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, as I said at the beginning, we have too many architects here, but we also speak to, to museographers and directors and curators. Um, to the next generation, can you, can you, do you want to break the ice, Emilio? I, my, my, <laughs> my, my tip is please give me a tip to, to, to keep working in this <laughs> architecture <laughs> because you have to be very strong. It's a very, uh, uh, it's very beautiful work, but at the same time it's really, really. And I think uh, there are, I, I'm sure that there are a lot of young architects that are going to transform this. you had to help us. Remember the glass of wine. <laughs> um, I don't know if I have to say something to a young architect, simply be optimistic. <laughs> if not, don't be an architect. No, I, am not, I am not to say anything about that. I think that uh, here we have talked about, about topics so difficult. We have tried to, to talk about museum when this is something so wide that it's impossible. Then in a moment, you, someone has said how to transform a building. This is another question that you can talk days and days and days. It's and true. at the end, you ask me for a advice for the new It's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. Okay. Well, well, well. I I would like to think the, the museums like, like places to find spirituality, situations, emotion, not just knowledge, this, uh, watching the pieces of art, just uh, the opposite that the stadium, no? places where you can go alone and find emotion and be and gain uh, after, after the visit, being better person than when you were. Okay, now we're concluding. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers of these two days for such brilliant, engaging, beautiful presentations, intelligent and incredibly rigorous. I um, am astounded by the quality of uh, Spanish uh, and architecture and, uh, and intelligence. Thank you all so much. <laughs>